asserts that the instructions in the priority document work to produce the results claimed for them. A claim to priority is implicitly such an assertion of enablement. If that is not effectively challenged, then the patentee has done enough. Uh, it follows uh, that a defendant should do more than merely issue a challenge to priority. He must explain the manner in which he says his failure to enable this should be set out in his pleadings. You will have to support his assertions by evidence. The court should be able to proceed on the basis that experimental data in the priority document is not only right, but reasonably repeatable. Although the onus remains on the patentee, the evidential burden shifts to the defendant. In some cases, he may not be able to discharge it without supporting experiments. Uh, and then there were some um, a very specific uh, facts about that particular case where I think uh, um, 
there was a dispute about um, what it was that the priority document was actually promising um, uh, and therefore whether even on its face it supported the invention claim uh, uh, various findings were made about that in favour of Chiron because of the peculiar factors of that case. So well, it, it turned out that the <laughs> experiments were fictitious, or <laughs> yes. at least that the results were not as described. Uh, yes, um, and there had been indeed quite a lot of evidence on the subject. Yes. Uh, but we rely on the general proposition there of, of, of Mr. Laddie is applicable. Thank you. On the facts of this case. Um, <coughs> secondly, um, I wanted, perhaps a little unwisely, uh, to uh, just go back on the legal debate that I had with my Lord Justice Arnold, um, <coughs> because having read the transcript, um, I, I felt that I may have been to some extent at cross purposes with, with your Lordship. Um, I referred to paragraph 19 of Lord Summerton. Um, but that's the paragraph that um, distinguishes between the ordinary product and pro or process claim and second medical use claim. Um, but I want to make it clear, I'm not saying there's a special law uh, on plausibility in relation to enablement that applies only to second medical use claims. Uh, my point is simply this, that... Um, Second medical use claims provide an illustration of um, a slightly unusual situation of predictive claiming, as we put it in our, uh, in our skeleton, where the patentee can't say, <coughs> I've done it and it works, because the ultimate trial of whether it works has not taken place, and everybody knows uh, that a lot can happen uh, in the course of clinical trials. To um, uh, which may make it turn out ultimately it doesn't work. Well, why is that any different from a first medical use? Uh, a first medical use would be the same. Right. And why is it any different if the claim so, is not explicitly yeah. to a first medical use, but when you read the specification, you see that that is in fact the intended use? Yeah, and, and that, that equally may be such a case. Right. But I'm saying, which is why I use the general phrase predictive claiming. Um, but what Lord Sumption, I think, is talking about is the ordinary case where you're not predicting utility. You're actually saying, I've made it and it works. Um, uh, and, of course, an ordinary sufficiency case raises um, issues a bit like the ones we've been looking at in Evans, um, where you test it by seeing if you can, in fact, replicate the teaching. You test enablement by seeing if you can replicate the teaching of the specification. And there are plenty of cases where the outcome has turned on that synthon as a, as a well-known case, uh, where sometimes it turns out that it can't be repeated, sometimes it's simply taught badly, uh, or whatever. Uh, and that's the usual sufficiency case that we would submit Lord Sumption is talking about. And it will be a very rare case in our submission, as Lord Sumption anticipates in that paragraph, where a description which can be tested in that way and ultimately does work actually sounds so implausible that the reader wouldn't believe what they were reading. And that's that narrow <laughs> dispute, really, uh, which lies between the parties on the law as to whether such a patent, whether where the author uh, recites that he's done it and it works and teaches how to do it and he does it badly. But it is inherently implausible on its face, um, would be insufficient. Um, and um, of course, we say it doesn't matter in the present case, it's our primary case, because there's no basis for a finding of lack of plausibility in the teaching uh, on the evidence um, as it was before the judge. And we also say that it doesn't matter because ultimately it was enabled. But the, uh, the dispute of law is a relatively narrow one 
and uh, I just want to make it clear we're, not, we're certainly not uh, attempting to trespass uh, or trample uh, on uh, the um, uh, principles of portability uh, established in many cases uh, in relation uh, especially to cases of predictive utility. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say briefly on, on the law, just to make our position on it clear. But ultimately, as I say, we say it doesn't matter in this case. Um, my third point, and this is really um, conclusory from many of the points I made uh, yesterday, uh, but I want to draw some of those points together, is how the squeeze argument uh, works or in fact ultimately fails uh, in the present case. Because as I made clear yesterday several times, uh, it's very important to remember that there's no uh, challenge to priority freestanding on its own in this case. There is a squeeze uh, against the obviousness attack on well, I'm not sure it won. It matters, but I, I, I'm not sure I agree at the moment with your statement that there's no free challenge to priority freestanding. I mean, there is a freestanding challenge to priority in the sense that it's not dependent on anything else. True, it is that Mr. Mitchison's case, as he said very clearly yesterday morning, is that the patent cannot both be entitled yes. to priority and non obvious. Yes, um, but nevertheless, his primary attack in this court is yeah. in fact lack of priority. It's, yes, it's non-obviousness, uh, or, or sorry, obviousness that he puts as his secondary case. Yes, uh, but it's on the basis, uh, and this is the only way in which the case was advanced at trial, uh, of uh, conflicting um, what was said to be conflicting facts. Needed to find obvious uh, to find non-obvious in favour of evidence. Yes, well, he, he was frank that at trial it was run the other way around, and the primary case yes. was obviousness, and and uh, uh, priority was was being advanced as a squeeze. Yes, which way round it goes? I'm not. I don't take issue with that. <laughs> a squeeze plainly can work both ways. That really makes any sense. But <laughs> if there is a squeeze, you say there is. a squeeze. We say it doesn't work at all. Um, uh, what? Well, the point I'm trying, the point I'm making, is that, um, for example, there wasn't a squeeze. It wasn't actually alleged that there was a squeeze against a an aggrievo obviousness case based on lack of te technical contribution over, say, the common general knowledge, or over Metzger, which was a, a document that I'm referring as referred to on a number of occasions, which was the 1994 paper. From the um, uh, Gibbs Group. Um, so, what wasn't being said by MGI, for example, and I'll, I'll come in a moment to why this wouldn't work anyway as an argument, <laughs> but just to be clear, they weren't saying to the extent to which, and I'm here putting words into their mouth that they didn't make. Uh, to the extent to which you need to rely on the gels and further experiments in the applications file to demonstrate a technical contribution <coughs> over the Metzger paper or over the common general knowledge, then you lack priority because the gels aren't there. Uh, because very much uh, in the course of his submissions to your lordships, it seemed that that really was the argument that he wishes he'd been running. Um, but that wasn't the case that was being put. And of course it couldn't have been put as a squeeze because there was no aggrievo uh, obviousness case uh, being run based on lack of technical contribution uh, against uh, the claims with the single exception uh, of uh, a case that was run against uh, the unamended claims, which included the use of azido-methyl-blocked nucleotides for a synthesis process as opposed to a sequencing. 
process. There was, there was a specific Grievo attack on that element of the claims, which was dealt with by amendment, in which you can see in the judgment, uh, the synthesis part of that claim was removed, and that dealt with uh, the only Grievo obvious attack uh, that was being run. Uh, and of course, there was no pleaded case of obviousness as such, based on the common general knowledge uh, or Metzger as freestanding objection. Uh, the <coughs> obviousness case uh, was only run uh, by trial, and there was a history to it that I referred to a, a little earlier, uh, on the basis of the Zavka Rodney prior uh, art. Uh, the The lack of technical contribution on the synthesis point is dealt with from paragraph 223 of the judgment, but obviously fell away because of the, because of the amendment. Um, so, in order to succeed on this appeal in my submission, the MGI must go back to their case as they put it at trial and show something in the finding of plausibility that would undermine the finding of non obvious over Zabgarodny so as to make it untenable or vice versa. Uh, and in our submission, when one looks at the case that way, one can immediately see there is simply no basis for that objection. Um, the relevant test for obviousness uh, applied to the Zabgarodny objection uh, is uh, uh, set out by the judge uh, in a passage which isn't challenged, uh, paragraph 193, where uh, the judge points out very fairly that in a way, as he puts it, the difference between Zevka Rodney and claim one of 578, which was uh, the primary uh, nucleotide claim that he was looking at, uh, is quite small. Uh, so claim one of 578 is, is, is not to the SPS process, it's to the modified nucleotide itself. And Ellie's saying there's very little between those, those claims, that claim is algorithmic in a sense, because Claim one claims a nucleotide with the five prime phosphates and with the azido nucleotide with the three prime oxygen, whereas Zevgarodny describes a nucleoside with such a group of the three prime oxygen. <coughs> but that, of course, um, uh, under uh, overlaid a a vast practical difference because, as he said, in order to render claim one invalid. A skilled person has to make the claimed molecule, and for that to happen, the skilled person has to have a reason to do so. Um, and in parenthesis, by the time we got to closing, the only reason that was being advanced, and various reasons had previously been advanced that had nothing to do with sequencing by synthesis, for example, making an antiviral. Um, but by the time we got to the end of trial, the only reason that was being put forward for making the claimed molecule uh, was uh, uh, in order to implement uh, a sequencing by synthesis process using uh, an RCT. I put that in parenthesis because that explains why the judge says what he says in the next sentence. As a result, the inventive steps uh, of all the relevant claims of the modified nucleotide pattern stand or fall together, so far as, as Agrodin is concerned. If performing sequencing by synthesis with, using a nucleotide with an azido methyl block 3 prime oxygen as a RCT is obvious over Zagorodny, then claim one also lacks inventive step because it would be obvious uh, to make the relevant 
compound. Uh, if that exercise was not obvious, then none of the claims, including claim one, uh, are obvious uh, for uh, the converse uh, reason. Uh, and none of that seems to be uh, in dispute. Uh, indeed, um, those, some of those passages were adopted by my own friends in their skeleton at paragraph uh, 23d. Uh, <coughs> and to be clear, um, even to get within the process claims, only one round of incorporation was in fact required. Uh, the uh, judge made that clear um, later on when he came to deal with um, sufficiency. I'll, I'll take you to those passages uh, a little bit later. Well, I think you showed us those yesterday. I think I did. Um, <coughs> because <coughs> one of the things that a friend uh, suggested uh, yesterday was that the judge read into the claim various uh, technical benefits to be achieved uh, by the invention. Uh, and I think the reason he was doing that and the reason he was um, stating it in that way uh, was because um, so far as Zabgorodny is concerned, uh, the skilled person uh, needed a reason uh, to make uh, the molecule. Um, and that was why judge actually rejected the case on Zabgorodny. But what my learned friend would like to take from the judgment uh, is the suggestion that the judge was somehow rejecting Zabgorodny because Zabgorodny uh, didn't teach um, uh, or um, make plausible some greater effect whereby you could do more than incorporate one, um, but you could actually sequence generally. But the point was, so far as motivation is concerned, the question was whether Zeb Gorodny on its face provided any motivation to the skilled person uh, to go ahead and make the nucleotide or perform a, an incorporation step when Zeb Gorodny doesn't mention SPS or even the possibility that azidomethyl might uh, be capable of being incorporated by polymerases uh, into a polynucleotide. Um, the squeeze looked at as a general proposition uh, would only work for my learned friend if the reasons that you would not uh, think from Zagorodny uh, uh, of making the nucleotide or embarking on an SPS uh, process using azidomethyl as a blocking group um, also applied uh, to the reader of the P2 priority document. And because, I think it was a point I made in general terms yesterday, because of the huge difference in the nature of the disclosure of these documents. That simply does not work. Um, and running through the points the judge took on Zabgorodny as the reasons why you would never get uh, to uh, uh, the modified nucleotide and you'd never think of starting an SPS process using uh, azidomethyl from Zabgorodny. They simply don't apply to the priority document. Paragraph 199, which we've looked at a number of times, that Zabgorodny just appears to be uh, a, an addition to the organic chemist's general toolbox of blocking groups. That plainly doesn't apply to P2, which is all about a specific uses of azidomethyl as a blocking group for a nucleotide in SPS. Uh, so there's no squeeze there. Uh, 201 um, 
even if you'd seen an out, you'd seen an analogy, you knew there were vast ranges of candidate groups, no particular reason to think this one was worth taking forward. That doesn't apply to P2 either, because P2 specifically tells you that azido methyl is a useful new group and tells you that it actually works. And not all these blocking groups work, uh, as, as, as we've seen multiple times in the evidence. P2 provides the very motive that Zevga Rodney does not. Paragraph 204, um, which is essentially expectation of success, might or might not work even if you got as far which you wouldn't have done on the judge's findings of Zevga Rodney uh, of thinking about it. It might or might not be incorporated by polymerase. That plainly doesn't apply to P2 either, where it is said to have been incorporated in an actual experiment uh, by polymerase. Um, uh, and indeed, um, as I think my Lord Lord Justice will be noted, um, in example two of P2, it even um, makes the point that Example one, which is the azido methyl, uh, incorporated um, more rapidly uh, than uh, the alternative which is being put forward uh, in example two. So it worked and it's better than other examples uh, in P2. You simply wouldn't know that it worked even if you started thinking about it uh, using Zabda Rodney. And then 209 to 210 on Zagorodny on D protection. Um, no reasonable prospect, no basis from which to infer 210. There was a reasonable prospect of getting a reasonable yield and speed. P2 gives you precisely that reasonable prospect 15 minutes, 50 degrees, at 100%. And <laughs> That's why we submit the squeeze case, whichever way you look at it, uh, is hopeless. Um, there is simply no connection between the critical findings uh, upon which Zabgorodny, the Zabgorodny attack was rejected uh, and any alleged absence of teaching uh, in the P2 document. Unless, of course, um, well, and friend had seriously succeeded in showing, well, attempted to show and succeeded in showing that the P2 document uh, experiment one was a fraud. But of course, there was no attempt to do that in the evidence, uh, and no possible basis I would submit on which, which that suggestion could have been made. Uh, so that's where we say the squeeze case goes. It, it, it was never going to work, uh, and um, it's not surprising. The judge rejects it in short order uh, when he's considering the plausibility case. Um, he doesn't set out all these reasons. Uh, he simply says it doesn't work, uh, and we would submit plainly it doesn't. Um, the reading into the claim point, which I promised to come back to, um, the suggestion the judge had rejected the case of obviousness because he was reading into the claim the stringent requirements for a blocking group that were referred to in the patent. Now, in principle, one could understand how a squeeze could, in theory, work uh, in those circumstances if the priority document, first of all, didn't make uh, those features that the judge was reading into the claim plausible, and that, that the lack of plausibility of achieving those had been the reason why the case on obviousness uh, had been lost. But uh, it doesn't work in this case, first of all, because the judge never did read those features into the claim when considering the obviousness case over Zabgorodny uh, or otherwise. On the contrary, uh, he consistently found 
that the claims only had very limited uh, requirements. Now one can see that uh, in uh, paragraph uh, 183, <coughs> uh, where he notes that there's no need separately to identify an inventive concept from what claim one actually claims, which is essentially a modified nucleotide with an acetomethyl group on the three prime oxygen. Uh, and then again in paragraph 193 that we've already looked at, where he's simply asking whether it's obvious from Zabgarodny to make the molecule, uh, no other requirements um, inserted. Uh, and then again, uh, in sections that I'm not sure whether you've looked at so far in this lengthy judgment, but uh, in the sufficiency section, uh, at where he's looking at the method claims, um, the uh, limited um, Number, the limited feature of those claims is very clear. So paragraph 294, which is dealing with claim 12 <coughs> of 578, which is the method claim, um, which uh, he holds uh, is um, uh, uh, achieved simply by um, sequencing a single nucleotide um, and that sequencing more than one nucleotide is not the essence or core of the invention of claim 12 either. So that's 294. Um, uh, and 297. NGI is right. This conclusion highlights that all that's needed all that's needed to be obvious to invalidate claim 12 was to sequence a single nucleotide using the three prime uh, azidometer blocked uh, nucleotide uh, with linker, uh, etc. Um, and then he says, um, <coughs> uh, notably, towards the end of that paragraph, the problem for MGI is that this dimension to the arguments and inventive step doesn't help them on the facts. Conclusion rejecting insufficiency is not inconsistent with the finding uh, of non obviousness. Um, and that is precisely uh, the point I'm making that because of the um, nature of the obviousness attack, um, it didn't actually assist uh, MGI uh, to have uh, the claim read. Uh, so simply and so broadly. Um, uh, ordinarily, one might think it might, but because they were only relying on Zabgar Rodney, it was never going to get them anywhere near the claim. Uh, then uh, it didn't help. But what one can see here is the judge is doing precisely the opposite of what my learned friend is suggesting, which is that he was somehow reading all sorts of strict technical requirements for achievement of. Um, multiple incorporation efficiency, etc., etc., into the claim. Uh, he plainly was not. Um, so, in our submission, um, <coughs> the Zagorodny squeeze doesn't <coughs> uh, uh, doesn't work, uh, and the uh, suggestion that the judge was construing the claim in a way that somehow helps one of the claims is quite equally doesn't work. The simple point was the case on Zabgarodny required motivation for the skilled person to leap to the idea of taking that blocking group and using it for this particular purpose. Uh, that's the very idea that is given and taught by experiment uh, in the priority document, but it was not part uh, of Zabgarodny or uh, the common general knowledge. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to close by um, dealing more generally with um, my learned friend's um, attack uh, on the technical contribution uh, 
represented by the priority document. As I've said in my submission, none of it helps him because of the, na the nature of his case is so limited that this can't possibly help. Um, because the squeeze on priority was not made against an allegation of aggrieved obviousness, Metzger, or, or anything else. And the level of technical contribution which would have been required to be shown to justify the claims on a problem and solution basis uh, against such an attack was not the subject of debate. However, <laughs> it is worth dealing with it in principle to defend <laughs> the disclosure of the priority document, which in our submission uh, has uh, everything uh, you need uh, to be motivated to take this forward. The uh, provision of a distinctively different blocking group uh, at the three prime on a nuclear tie, never suggested before, which is technically effective to achieve even a single round of in incorporation and unblocking uh, is, in our submission, perfectly sufficient on any view to amount to a technical contribution. Uh, and that fits with what the judge said on the issue of sufficiency uh, in relation to the patent itself uh, in a series of findings which are not challenged on this appeal. Um, <coughs> One can see that, um, for example, uh, in uh, paragraph uh, 288, where, and your lordship, again, your lordships haven't been <coughs> troubled with the uh, sufficiency arguments. Uh, because I'm going to see them uh, ultimately. Obviously. But they, uh, there were, if you've, if you've read this part of the judgment, a series of Regeneron and Kaimab uh, objections to the sufficiency of the patent across the breadth of the claim. Um, and uh, it was said that the whole range of linkers that could be attached to the modified nucleotide comprised a relevant range within the climate principle and all ought to have been properly enabled. Uh, and it was also said that achieving uh, read lengths of uh, anything up to, um, I don't know how many, maybe 100 nucleotides, but anyway, multiple, multiple <laughs> read lengths was also a range. Uh, which uh, needed to be achieved. And, and the judge considered that by reference to what the invention here really was, what was the core or essence of this invention. And he held in 288, uh, even in relation to the process claims, that the essence of the invention is a sequencing method, in the middle of that paragraph, whose utility derives from the use of a 3 o blocked nucleotide, 3 prime o blocked nucleotide. Uh, plainly, the particular nucleotide polymerase link of open cleavage competition is chosen to have to be suitable. Beyond the simple fact of being suitable, their individual type doesn't significantly affect the value of the method to achieve the purpose for which it's been carried out. And then again, on, on the subject of read length, which I think I've already taken you to paragraph 294, um, uh, he holds that. Um, simply um, being able to incorporate a single nucleotide uh, is the essence or core of this invention because it is indeed a uh, valuable uh, technical uh, contribution. Uh, so far as the um, numerous references my learned friend made to the stringent requirements uh, set out in paragraph 5, of the patent, I can say. The judge um, refers to those uh, uh, in paragraph 134 through to 136. And I think you've probably been shown uh, these paragraphs already. Uh, he, well, he, this whole section starts at 
uh, 132. Um, 132 notes that the patent explains invention based on modified nucleotides, modified so as to have a removable protecting group. We then get paragraph 4, the judge deals with 133, uh, which is about the sequencing by synthesis using RCT scheme, which of course was um, part of the CGK but never actually achieved. And then paragraph 5, which is the stringent requirement, uh, is actually about the characteristics of the blocking group which are needed. And this, in our submission, is where the patentee is um, uh, setting out uh, things which, uh, as the judge reports, uh, would be ideal features of such a blocking group. Um, and these are long-term stability, efficient incorporation, total blocking, uh, secondary incorporation, have the ability to be removed under mild conditions, uh, etc. Those are the stringent requirements, as he says at 135, those in, in 005, um, because those are the requirements of the blocking group, uh, and that's what uh, uh, this patent uh, is about, so far as it's inventive contribution uh, is concerned. Um, and uh, there is very similar teaching uh, to that in the priority document, which defines, again, uh, some general aims uh, or ideals uh, of an improved blocking group on page two. Um, uh, in similar language, uh, and what is notable in my submission is that when one looks uh, at the priority document, um, and I think I may have mentioned this already, but it's worth um, looking at again in this context. When one looks at what the priority document teaches is achieved by Zido Methyl, in this example, um, it is ticking precisely those boxes. <laughs> like, uh, which have been set out um, and which are ultimately referred to by the patentee and the patent as uh, the stringent requirements. Uh, and that's, uh, you can see the priority document uh, at tab four of the supplementary bundle. one sees, um, I'm sorry, I referred earlier to page two is where, is where this document sets out um, the general requirements of the blocking group, reversible structural uh, from line 10, reversible structural modification, preventing any further nucleotide incorporation, uh, incorporation must be removable under reaction conditions that don't interfere with integrity of DNA. Sequencing can then continue the incorporation of the next block labeled nucleotide and then refers to high yield, highly specific and dramatic steps facilitating the cycle. So that's the, the general aim. And what is taught in the examples um, is specifically referring to the achievement of uh, these ends. Um, successful incorporation number of di by a number of different polymerases efficient blocking and subsequent removal under neutral aqueous conditions using water-soluble phosphine, allowing further extension. Uh, and it's said to be stable, as you can see under the diagram, incorporated by enzymes, efficient blocking. And then we have the 15 minutes, which is the um, yield. Uh, of, uh, of the speed of the yield and then 100% removal and then bottom right ready for next incorporation so it's teaching uh, in our submission those advantages uh, for uh, its product uh, this is not um, a, a priority document uh, which is addressing some other issue <laughs> it is doing precisely the same thing 
uh, that the patent is teaching as the benefit of the invention. It is therefore disclosing uh, the invention, the inventive contribution, uh, and anything else you might require uh, of a uh, priority document. And I've run through this because the way my own friend has uh, stressed it, as if this priority document bore no relation to the stringent requirements of the Nobel Prize. But it plainly does. But I should stress that the case at trial didn't attempt to show uh, that this priority document did not meet the stringent requirements. It was not advanced uh, in that way at all. We could have had a debate about it uh, had it been uh, the subject of expert evidence. Uh, but one's left with my learned friend simply making assertions and me <laughs> simply making my own on the basis of the document. In my submission, if your lordships are interested, uh, there is plenty there uh, to support uh, the very same technical contribution uh, that the patent uh, is uh, claiming. Um, a kind of loose end point. Um, my learned friend referred several times to this being a broad claim because it incorporated, it, it, it included any type of linker attached to the um, fluorophore, which is what is used to do the ultimate detection, uh, as if that played some relevant role uh, in the priority of business and squeeze. Our submission it plainly doesn't. Uh, the point on linkers was run and was defeated as a insufficiency point. It was said, as your lordships have seen, that the claim was too broad and uh, not enabled for any type of uh, linker and label. But the judge rejected that. He said that wasn't part of the core of the invention anyway, uh, but that the skilled person would have no difficulty uh, in implementing sensible linkers and labels. Uh, the use of sensible linkers and labels is equally disclosed in the priority document. In fact, I don't need to take you to it, but uh, referred to uh, at length in very similar terms uh, to the description in the patent. So insofar as the claim is broad in that sense, it's not a relevant sense so far as uh, invented concept is concerned. Uh, but other than that, in our submission, the claim is actually not broad at all because uh, it is limited to uh, a, a particular um, modified nucleotide with a particular blocking group at the three prime. Uh, the judge would write find uh, that that was the core of the invention uh, and uh, it's not one of those cases uh, where one has to somehow predict uh, unexpected utility uh, across a whole range of products uh, when it comes to what matters in this case which is whether uh, you get incorporation whether you can be blocked um, it turns on the um, uh, blocking group itself, uh, and uh, that is what is taught. Um, my lords, um, those are the points that I, I wanted to make coming out of yesterday. If there's any further points that I could help you with, uh, no, thank you. Most yes, my lord, let me deal with obviousness first. Shorter topic. Um, uh, there's not much in addition to say uh, to add to what I said yesterday. Um, it, it all turns on the definition of the inventive concept, which the judge set out um, at paragraph 152. And as we say, our primary case is that um, that cannot give priority, and the judge fell into error in saying that the priority was uh, for that invention uh, found in P2. But if we're wrong about that, then um, uh, inventive step uh, plainly needs to be revisited. Um, my learned friend says 
um, I'm running points that I wasn't running below. Um, uh, he, he says, I, 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 I'm trying to make a point out of the comparison between Metzger um, and uh, the patent, um, uh, and I haven't got a pleading of obviousness over the common general knowledge. My lord, um, that case, the case of um, what technical contribution the patent allegedly gives over the Metzger 94 um, work and the work surrounding it was front and center in our case below. And it, as, as you've seen, the, law, the judge referred to my expert's report on the point and his point, oh, well, the patent doesn't provide much of a benefit over Metzger, if at all, and he rejected that. Um, um, it was plainly set out under the heading of technical contribution in our closing, paragraphs 228 and 229. They're not before the court, but um, uh, they can be provided if needed. Um, then it was set out again um, in paragraph 310 under the heading of priority. And finally, the point was made um, in relation to obviousness and sufficiency in the relation between the two in paragraph 324 of our closing. So all these points were taken below. Um, and of course, the nature of a squeeze is that um, you're saying to the judge, you can't jump one way without running into problems in somewhere else. And you're trying to conf constrain the, the judge or the other side to, in, in their arguments. Now we've arrived in the Court of Appeal, we have the judgment. The judge has jumped one way. And we say um, it's plain, uh, uh, having done so, that he fell into error. So it's not so much a squeeze now uh, as a case that he was wrong on priority. Um, and if he wasn't <coughs> wrong on priority because somehow the technical contribution is different, then that does um, resurrect uh, the squeeze and, and means that obviousness is again live. So I think, I think your lordships um, ha have that point from the exchanges between uh, my lord, Lord Justice Arnold and Mr. Perders this morning. Um, the only additional points on, on obviousness, my learned friend yesterday seemed to be trying to refight old battles about the common general knowledge. Um, but that's unnecessary um, uh, because we don't challenge the judge's findings on the common general knowledge um, in relation to obviousness. Indeed, we embrace them when it comes to priority. Um, uh, I, I took you to the passages of uh, Professor Ledley's evidence yesterday where we say if the, if the tech inventive concept is um, to be differently defined, the judge fell into error. My learned friend had no answer to that. Um, uh, and finally, he made the point uh, that one has to be careful about hindsight in uh, dealing with obviousness. Um, uh, that may be, but of course, hindsight is equally <coughs> relevant when one is looking at the priority document, having already reviewed the specification of the patent, as the judge did. And if one asks the question, would the judge have come to the same conclusion as to the technical contribution if he had only seen the priority document and never seen the patent and all the gels and data in it, we submit the answer is clearly no. Uh, and that is the mistake that he made. Um, uh, and that is why we say um, uh, we uh, should succeed in relation to the priority appeal. So just to rephrase that submission, you're saying that this is one of these cases where the judge ought to have proceeded by first of all addressing disclosure of the priority document and considering the consequences of that and only subsequently addressing the disclosure of the patent. My Lord, yes. And plainly, um, we can't expect the judge to be put into a box and given documents in a sequential order. Um, as, no, as, but, as the but, 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 but of course the judge has to look at all the documents in the same trial. Yes. <laughs> that, that goes without saying. Yeah. But in terms of the approach in, in the judgment, that would have in your submission have been the correct sequence. Yes, and we say that's the mistake. He, he, he plainly put enormous emphasis on the data and experiments in the patent, and that he failed to consider in our submission um, the effect of the absence of that data. All right, in, in the uh, but, but was he invited in submissions to adopt that approach? Because it's certainly an approach, um, as one can see, that, for example, from my judgments in Dinix, which is in the bundle, but also I've got to adopt the same approach in Medimune. Um, both of those cases, in my judgment, I was careful to consider the judgment, the disclosure of the priority document before considering the disclosure of the patent. 
But then in both of those cases, it was submitted to me by at least one party. Uh, and I think even in Medibune, it might even have been common ground, I'm not sure. But certainly at least one party in both of those cases submitted to me that that was the correct approach to adopt. Was that submission made to the judge in this case? I don't think that we, we asked the judge to look at the priority document first, to know my knowledge. But right. we plainly raised the squeeze argument um, so that he knew that, that we were saying there was a tension between inventive step, sufficiency, and priority. Yeah. Um, a, a, and for those reasons, he did have the point fully in mind. My lord, um, uh, or, or ought to have had it fully in mind, uh, and we, we say he, he fell into error in, in the judgment. Um, my lord, so moving on to the priority appeal, um, the first point is the pleading point, the, the absence of a respondent's notice. Um, there are, in fact, three different points which my learned friend is seeking to run all of which should have been subject to a respondent's notice. Um, the first is whether it's open as a matter of law to argue that plausibility is not a requirement for enablement of a priority document. That point first emerged in my learned friend's skeleton just over a month ago. It wasn't raised below. Um, the second point is whether he's entitled to seek to distinguish between, between claims one and seven, the, the product claims and the method claims, that point emerged for the first time uh, by reference to the EPO case provided late last Friday, uh, and then more fully on my learned friend's feet yesterday. That point was also not raised below. Um, and the third point is his revised version of the technical contribution, which emerged for the first time yesterday, and which I'll come back to um, in a moment, if I may. Um, I, I don't want to labour this point, but if I just show your lordship very briefly the notice of appeal, which is at core one, at page 13 of the bundle. And um, you will just look very briefly at paragraph one, which is the um, uh, grounds on plausibility, lack of priority. Those are standalone grounds. And in our submission, they couldn't be clearer uh, as to what our case uh, is uh, and was at that stage when this was filed. And if my learned friend had wanted to uphold the judgment on different grounds, for example, by saying that there was no such thing as plausibility in the law of priority, or there was a difference between the claims the judge should have taken into account, um, he could and should have done so um, in a respondent's notice. And the reason why this matters, my lords, is because Different attacks have been run at different times against different claims within these patents. But we have sought to streamline the case to focus those attacks, to focus on those attacks which knock out all of the claims. Uh, and so you've heard um, that there were antiviral, uh, antiviral based attack against claim one only. Um, there were insufficiency attacks against the method claims only. Um, the antiviral attack was dropped uh, before the end of the trial. The insufficiency uh, uh, attacks have been dropped as part of this appeal. And so it would be quite unfair for Illumina to seek to raise a point seeking to differentiate the claims for the purposes of priority for the first time at this very late stage on appeal, given the history of how the case has been dealt with up to now. Uh, and as my learned friend has not sought permission to adduce a late respondent's notice, nor provided one, um, any such application would be strongly resisted, and your lordship should proceed on the basis that the points are not part of his case. My lord, moving on, um, your lordship's asked uh, a couple of times yesterday about the evidence on the priority document, um, and just so your lordships um, have seen it, I'll, I'll just show you the two passages um, so your lordships have it in mind, and there's no, no dispute about uh, what it was. Um, firstly, it's in the supplementary bundle at tab 11. And this is the uh, first statement of uh, MGI's expert, Professor Marks. And if your lordships just turn to uh, page 252, um, this is uh, uh, under the, the heading of the, on the previous page, priority. Uh, and then there are two paragraphs um, from the Marks. Perhaps your lordship could just read paragraphs 11 and, 11 and 12. You can see what the Marks is saying. Just 
to note, though, in the middle of 11, one of the points Professor Marx makes there, he says, oh, incorporation with reasonable efficiency by more than one polymerase is what the skilled person would have expected to be the case from the common general knowledge. And that's, of course, the point that the judge rejected when he was dealing with the patents. And he said that was, um, he, he didn't accept that uh, you would expect incorporation from the common general knowledge. So pl plainly, um, uh, as, I, as I indicated, our own, our, our, the main thrust of our case was it was obvious. But having uh, rejected that case, um, uh, the flip side of the squeeze um, is now live. Um, uh, and that's uh, the appeal we're, we're obviously pursuing here. Um, my lords, the other uh, bit of evidence is at tab 16. Uh, and it's uh, Professor Ledley's cross. And um, I asked him, it's page uh, 356 of the transcript. Uh, page 303 of the bundle. And um, I'm, I'm just finishing asking mm -hmm. Professor Ledley about Zafirodny, where the temperature is 20 degrees uh, in the experiment there. And I ask him at um, uh, 16, I ask him a, a sort of thought experiment at 16 uh, about uh, doing an experiment at 50 and what difference that would make, 50 being the temperature in the prior stock. And perhaps you could just read 16 down to line 15 on the following page. What's that got to do with the disclosure of so, the priority? Well, it, it, it's merely a, a, a asking about a, what, would, what would you expect if you used a temperature of 50 degrees. And the professor says, well, I'd be worried about the compatibility of the reaction conditions with the in integrity of the DNA. Um, uh, and then he says, I wouldn't know what happened until I'd actually seen, seen the results. So again, that's consistent with um, the judge's approach, which is that the skilled person wants to see results here, wants to see data. Um, to know that things are going to work, and a mere assertion um, is not good enough. So, my lords, that, 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 those are the two, the two passages I thought I ought to show you. Moving on to the law, um, I think I, I was going to deal at some length with Warner Lambert again, but I think in the light of my learned friend's submissions this morning, I can take it much more quickly. Um, uh, and, and your lordship, my lord, Lord Justice Arnold, already put it to my learned friend. Um, in short, Warner Lambert is not just focused on second medical use. Um, there are passages in the judgment, at paragraph 23, dealing with aggrievo type claims, paragraph 25, referring to Biogen and Exxon, neither of which were second medical use claims, paragraph 26, uh, dealing with Mobile and Bayer in, uh, in the EPO, and Biogen also, again, again, not, not medical use claims. Uh, and so we say um, it's just not right to say there's a special rule for uh, uh, second medical uses. What, what my learned friend said this morning, he said this is all about um, predictive claiming, where you've got a claim that requires some prediction. Uh, and of course, that is what the judge found here. He found that um, you needed to, uh, the invention was about identifying a molecule with certain characteristics characteristics of paragraphs four and five. Um, uh, and there's also the further point, the aggrievo point, that there is a class of, of compounds here, uh, and they all have to have uh, a beneficial use. So this is plainly, fairly and squarely in, in the predictive claiming territory. And therefore, the judge was right to um, uh, consider plausibility as part of his assessment. Now, the, the only additional points to make on Warner Lambert are these, my lords, if I may. So this is just just take the authority out. Uh, again, it's uh, authority bundle tab 16. There, there, there are three points to make, really. Um, firstly, um, my learned friend this morning uh, sought to guess that the standard was. Um, Plausibility only kicks in if what is disclosed is inherently implausible. 
so that, that's the only time you have to get into this. And that is precisely the submission that I've attempted to make in the Supreme Court, which is rejected in paragraph 30 of uh, uh, Lord Sumption's uh, opinion. Um, uh, and precisely the same words. He, he, he actually described my argument as being it applies only where the therapeutic effect suggested in the patent is inherently implausible. Precisely the same phrase my learned friend used this morning. Um, and, and that so that, that can't be right. Um, th the next point uh, to make is in paragraph 40, which my learned friend referred you to yesterday, uh, which I hadn't addressed you on. Um, uh, and the, para the sentence in paragraph 40, which he alighted on, um, is uh, in the middle of 40. It says, the question is not whether it works, but whether the contribution to the art consisting in the discovery that it can be expected to work has, be, has been sufficiently disclosed in the patent. And that's precisely what we say the problem is here. It's not, the question is not whether or not azetomethyl works. It's whether there's sufficient disclosure in the priority document to expect it to work in the way that the judge has characterized the technical contribution. Uh, and we say that um, uh, is not the case because uh, the characteristics of paragraphs four and five in the patent are not supported by the priority document because the judge needed the data in the patent to convince him that uh, azetomethyl satisfies those stringent requirements. And in the absence of that data, uh, the uh, claimed priority must fail. And so our point is that the disclosure of the priority document did not uh, satisfy the test in paragraph 40, it did not provide enough material uh, uh, to support um, the notion that azetomethyl can be expected to be to work um, in the way uh, that paragraphs 4 and 5 of the patent, as the judge found, was central to the technical contribution require. Um, the third point uh, to make on Warner-Lambert uh, is this. My learned friend um, sought to bolster his arguments by suggesting that it was enough for enablement if the skilled person can just go ahead and perform routine experiments to demonstrate that the technical effect is indeed plausible. Um, and presumably in the present case, what, what my then friend would say is that um, the skilled person reading the priority document would then go ahead and do the experiments in the patent, uh, and from that uh, plausibility um, uh, can be found, uh, as the judge indeed did find. Um, but in our submission, that's precisely what Lord Sumption said was not permissible. And this is precisely the point where Lord Sumption uh, differed from the approach of the Court of Appeal. My lady friend sought to say yesterday there was no difference, but this is precisely where there was a difference. Um, and this can be seen in the passages um, uh, from 47 in the judgment onward. And this was the, um, your, my Lord, Lord Justice Arnold may remember, there, there was a um, claim 10, I think it was, which was a claim to peripheral neuropathic pain, which your Lordship had upheld at first, the first instance as being just plausible, um, and the Court of Appeal uh, uh, didn't interfere with. But uh, Lord Sumption said, no, it wasn't, not even that claim was plausible. Um, uh, and um, the reasons he'd give are from 47 onwards. Um, uh, and I don't need to get into all of the detail, but uh, 48, end of 48, is just before he says he's going to interfere with the findings below, he says, uh, the question, it must be remembered, is not whether it is plausible, but whether the specification discloses something that would make it so in the eyes of the skilled person. And he then went on to uh, look at the facts in that case, and, and in that case, there was a reference in the specification to two particular tests. Kim and Chung uh, uh, models, and, and there was also the, the Bennett model. He refers to those in 49. Um, he pointed out in, in paragraph 50, just towards the end, um, uh, the last five lines, he says, but neither the specification nor the common general knowledge of the art supplies any reason for supposing that pregabalin affects the operation of that mechanism, or even that it might well do. In particular, there's nothing to suggest, even as a hypothesis, that pregabalin works with peripheral neuropathic pain by blocking central sensitization. And we say 
draw parallels with this case, there's nothing in the specification nor the common general knowledge, in the, uh, nothing in the specification of the priority document nor the common general knowledge uh, to supply any reason to think that a ZEDO methyl would be any better than any other blocking group in green and works, not even a hypothesis. Um, the only thing that is provided uh, is uh, the, the data that only appears for the first time in the patent, and that's what the judge found supported uh, the technical contribution. Uh, and then in 52, um, uh, the Lord Sumption goes on to say, um, it cannot, in my view, be enough to justify a monopoly that it is possible that, that a drug which is effective for inflammatory pain would also be effective for hepatic pain in the absence of any reason to suppose that the possibility had some scientific base, basis or that it was more than speculative. Um, plausibility, may, and then he goes on the last sentence, everything's possible, it's not impossible, but not impossible is very far from being an acceptable test for sufficiency. Plausibility may be easy to demonstrate, but it calls for more than that. And then he deals with um, the point that uh, Lord Justice Floyd had made in the Court of Appeal. He had up, upheld uh, uh, my Lord, Lord, Lord Justice Arnold, but he found an additional reason. And he said um, in 133 in the Court of Appeal decision um, that uh, there were simple tests which could be carried out, and that in the course of carrying out these tests, the skilled person would discover that pregabalin did in fact uh, uh, work in these models, and that would lead them on to, uh, uh, that would be enough to uh, provide a plausible belief uh, that it would treat peripheral neuropathic pain. Um, and he deals with this in 53. Um, he recites the evidence below the quote um, where the expert said, yes, you would go ahead and do some more tests. Um, and then he uh, uh, quotes uh, from uh, one of the experts on the following page and the reference to doing things step by step. Um, but he says this isn't enough. Not, this is not enough for plausibility. Uh, and he deals with it just above the bottom hole punch on uh, 771. And he says, um, picking it up, he says, in classical insufficiency cases, where the question is whether the disclosure in the patent enables the skilled person to perform the invention, the skilled person may be assumed to supplement the disclosure by carrying out simple tests. In cases like this one, where the invention is novel, but the objection of insufficiency is that the claim exceeds the disclosed contribution to the art, the role of hypothetical simple tests is necessarily more limited. He then goes on to refer to the Johns Hopkins decision in the EPO, um, and it, it's not right. Uh, uh, there's no contribution if, to the art um, if it only poses a problem but doesn't solve one. Or as Lord Hoffman observed in a passage that I've already quoted, the notion that something is worth trying cannot be enough without more to justify uh, a, a monopoly. Um, he goes on to refer to the specification in that case, and then he says, the mere fact that the skilled team faced with an apparent discrepancy between the breadth of the claims and the absence of supporting data in the specification would be encouraged to fill the gap by carrying out tests of its own that only to confirm the absence of any disclosed contribution to the art. So we say, my learned friend's attempt to plug the gap yesterday by saying, oh, yes, you could just go ahead and do these further simple tests um, that are found in the patent cannot be the right answer. Uh, this has been rejected by Lord Sumption. Um, uh, uh, and my own friend's reference this morning, he repeated it this morning, he said, oh, you'd be motivated to take this forward from the priority document. That is not enough uh, 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 to found um, plausibility on the basis of Lord Sumption's uh, ruling. Uh, perhaps the other way of putting it, the, the shorter way of putting it, is Lord Justice Kitchen in Medimmune, which I showed your lordships yesterday, um, uh, and he said um, uh, it's not permissible to consider obvious steps for the purposes of priority. That's a question of obviousness, not priority. Um, uh, and therefore, it's not enough to give the skilled person the same invention by allowing them to take obvious steps. The invention has to be given directly and unambiguously. That's what he said in Medimmune. Um, and we say, um, quite right. Um, second priority document in this case does not give the same invention directly and unambiguously. It is necessary to take further steps to make it plausible uh, and there, that is prohibited uh, under the law of priority properly applied and therefore my learned friend's attempts to plug the gap uh, fail.
Well, that was Warner Lambert. Um, the only other authorities my own friend uh, took you to, I need to comment on Idenix. Um, your Lordship raised the point about added matter and, and um, uh, plausibility. Well, we say for priority, um, the point runs a fortiori because for priority, it has to be the same invention. It has to be equivalent in substance and form and has to be enabling. So if anything, um, uh, the requirements are even more stringent for priority than they are for added matter. Uh, 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 but your Lordship has, has the point on that. Um, final authority my own friend referred to yesterday was Gemvax, and he thought to try and draw parallels between uh, the position in Gemvax and the position here, because in Gemvax there was a point being made about absence of data. Um, uh, of course, all cases ultimately turn on their facts, um, uh, and there is no single rule that can apply to all types of claims in all types of patents um, about the sort of evidence that is needed for plausibility. But the best guidance we have is Lord Sumption, of paragraph 37 of, of Warner Lambert, which I showed you, Lordship, yesterday. Um, and the simple point in this case is that the judge has identified what he needed to establish the technical contribution of the patent, but that evidence, that data, is manifestly missing from the priority document. Uh, and on that basis, uh, a finding of priority simply cannot follow. So, my lord, the final topic um, uh, is um, my learning friend's attempt to reformulate the inventive contribution. Um, uh, uh, and uh, he says it again this morning, but he, it's, it's on page 117 of the transcript yesterday um, when asked directly by, by my Lord Lord Justice Arnold. His characterization of it yesterday was merely an azido methyl blocking group as a reversible chain terminator at the three prime position on a nucleotide, thus enabling at least one incorporation step. So he planted his uh, flag firmly uh, in the area that all that was needed for the invention in this case was a single incorporation step. And he repeated this uh, characterization in, at page 140 of the transcript in the context of priority. And there are two problems with this, we say. First, um, if this was the technical contribution, then it is no different to the common general knowledge in particular, uh, the uh, incorporation step disclosed in Metzger 1994. Um, uh, so um, on that basis, uh, the patent is contributing no more than a, an alternative blocking group without uh, the ex expectation that it would have the characteristics um, in paragraphs four and five. Um, but the, the more important point for my, for, for, for my appeal is that this is clearly not what the judge found. The judge went much, much further than my learned friend's characterization of the inventive contribution, um, both when he dealt with inventive step um, and indeed when he, uh, in other areas of the judgment where he was dealing with other issues. And the clearest example of this um, is uh, in the judgment at the end of the inventive step. In the, in, when the judge goes through the Liliaikos factors in paragraph 213, and uh, he um, uh, points out at little seven, uh, at the end of the discussion on inventive step, in unexpected results, he says the three is either methyl blocking group has the useful features promised by the patent in paragraphs four and five. This was not predictable from the prior art. So he's clearly putting the contribution of the patent much higher than my learned friend would have it. We can understand why my learned friend on this appeal tries to water it down, but the judge was putting it much higher. And um, that is the inventive contribution that we have to deal with for the purposes of priority. Um, and even in the later passages, which my learned friend took you through to this morning, so if we look at 294, uh, where he's dealing with sufficiency, um, my learned friend sought to get something from the last sentence of 294, um, where the judge said, it cannot be said that sequencing more than one nucleotide is the essence or core of the invention uh, uh, of claim 12 either. Well, 
that's ripe for, for, for two reasons. Firstly, because if that was the essence of, or core of claim 12, it's no better than Metzger, because it's just one round. So that can't be right. But um, what the judge had found earlier um, is that um, it's the use of a nucleotide which has the characteristics of paragraphs four and five of the patent, which is the inventive contribution. It's not simply doing one round, because that would be no better than the common general knowledge. Uh, and so, and it's this, the multiple step experiment in the patent is what is needed, is to make, to make this inventive contribution plausible. And we see um, in 298, uh, I think I did show you this uh, yesterday, um, where the judge says, uh, he, he deals with sufficiency on the basis of what the claims um, require, but then he goes on to say in 298 in the middle, essentially, the azido methyl blocking group does meet the stringent requirements referred to in the patent. So he clearly has the technical contribution uh, well in mind there. Um, and the previous sentence, there is a technical advance for the reasons already referred to. Uh, and that is uh, absolutely right, um, because he is putting the contribution much higher than simply one round of uh, uh, incorporation, uh, which was already known in the common general knowledge. So, my lords, um, this really is an extraordinary attempt by my learned friend to backtrack from the findings of the judge um, on technical contribution, again made without uh, a respondent's notice. Uh, and we say the only real reason for this is to try and justify the judge's findings on, on priority and perhaps to suggest uh, that the judge had this lower contribution in mind when he looked at the priority document. Because, of course, um, all that the priority document shows is an equivalent uh, number of incorporations to the common general knowledge, to Metzger. There's only one round there. And indeed, uh, on one view, the priority document shows even less than Metzger 1994, because it doesn't even show the addition of a further base. So it's plain that um, that cannot be the right uh, technical contribution for the purposes of priority. Um, because if it is, it's clearly different to the technical contribution which the judge found for the purpose of obviousness and repeated elsewhere in his judgment. Um, and so um, final lap is just to make this point good uh, and to underline um, how clear it is from the judgment that what the judge uh, had found was the contribution um, is as we have submitted and how that is not present in the priority document. So um, if I can pick it up in one, two, six, um, where we have the summary of the common general knowledge. Um, and uh, the point I want to emphasize is the middle sentence in 126. Um, what the skilled person was looking for in SBS was, the, the judge summarized, the skilled person also understood that to make it work, one needed to come up with a system in which one could repeatedly um, incorporate nucleotides linked to specific labels one at a time in a reversible way but they did not know with any degree of specificity what particular problem or problems had to be solved to take this forward. And, and so what um, the judge is emphasising it needs to be repeatable and you need to have nucleotides linked to specific labels. And of course neither Metzger nor the second priority document sought to demonstrate any efficacy with labels. Neither of them used a label, but the judge has pointed out here that you need to have labels linked to the nucleotide to be of any use. Uh, and so um, uh, we say, and without the label, you can't do SBS. And this is, runs through the judge's reasoning. If we go then on to 133 uh, of the judgment, we see the judge summarizing paragraph 4, and of course, little 2 in paragraph 4. Uh, requires the incorporated nucleotide to be read using an appropriate label attached, and then you've got to remove the label. Um, uh, little 5 refers to the uh, addition of the next blocked labeled nucleotide, uh, and then little, uh, little, little 4 refers to that, and then little 5 on the next page uh, requires the entire process to be high yielding, highly specific chemical and enzymatic steps facilitate multiple cycles of sequencing, so again, multiple cycles, um, and of course that is using the labels uh, referred to. Um, 
Then, 139, we have the judge's focus on the experiment in the patent. Um, again, uh, he emphasizes uh, the presence of the fluorescent label in that, the last line uh, of the text, uh, penultimate line of the text of 139. And indeed, you can see in the diagram, which the judge has borrowed from Prof Professor Ledley, there is the label. Uh, I don't know if you've got a color version or a, or a black and white version, is, but the, the label is the larger of the blobs just between the G and the T in, in the second uh, 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 diagram of the, of the DNA. Uh, and, and that is plainly a necessary part of um, uh, SBS. Um, one feet four, four uh, three of the judgment. Again, the judge emphasizes at the end of 143 the deblocking and removal of the fluorescent label. Uh, 150 of the judgment. Uh, this is the, the, where the judge brings together his uh, findings on the experimental data. And again, uh, there's the reference that three lines up, four lines up from the bottom, the judge uh, finds that the blocking group and fluorescent label are capable of being removed using a water soluble phosphine uh, to regenerate the hydroxyl, allowing further rounds of incorporation. He accepts that evidence. And again, he brings it all together in 152. Um, that includes uh, the labels. So um, when we turn to the second priority document, um, there are a number of things missing uh, from it, not just the gels um, uh, and the commentary that goes uh, with it in the patent. Um, uh, uh, there are, uh, it's a different experiment being carried out in the second priority document to, to the ones in the patent. Um, there is no label in the second priority document, just as there was no label in the Metzger uh, work. There's an unknown polymerase, so uh, there could well be different incorporation conditions. There are different deblocking conditions, and none of these uh, conditions appear anywhere in the patent uh, later filed. Um, in fact, the judge found that the efficiencies in the patent were way less than 100%. Um, and one uh, asked the question if, if uh, the data in P2 was um, genuine and real, um, it would surely have been replicated in the patent uh, and, and the same material found. Um, the reality is that with the downbeat expectations of the common general knowledge um, and the failure of uh, the second priority document to provide any explanation as to why the azido-methyl group was better than any of the groups listed in Green and Woods, um, then the skilled person would have got nowhere near understanding that uh, from P2 that the azido-methyl group satisfied the stringent conditions of paragraphs four and five of the pattern. And my own friend didn't even uh, attempt to suggest to the contrary and instead, uh, his answer is to attempt to downgrade the technical contribution of the patent to a single round of incorporation. We say that's extremely telling. We say that's not open to him uh, based on the judge's findings. Um, it's clear that the judge in our submission uh, fell into error. Um, just turning to, to that uh, section on priority uh, in the judgment uh, for the last time, 238 to 241. Um, we, we, in our submission, the prophetic paragraph 241 plainly highlights why the judge went wrong. Um, because uh, if it made no difference as to whether or not the experiment had actually been carried out, then in our submission, the judge can only have been thinking that P2 was equivalent to a list of blocking groups such as in Green and Woods. Um, but of course, with the downbeat attitude in common general knowledge which the judge found, indeed thinking it might not even work at all, there was certainly no basis to think that the identification of an alternative blocking group, which could be incorporated and deblocked once without a label, would lead to something which satisfied the stringent conditions in paragraphs four and five. Um, yet this is precisely what the judge has found. So we say um, 241 exposes the error in thinking of the judge. But the heart of the appeal is the failure by the judge to apply a consistent standard. Um, alternatively, um, uh, that the judge has uh, wrongly uh, applied hindsight in assuming that P2 would lead somehow to the patent. That's either impermissible or wrong in law. And so it all really turns on his conclusions in paragraphs 240, 
and what he means by um, the three prime azido methyl blocking group will work at the end of 240. If he meant, um, would this, was it plausible that the three prime uh, azido methyl blocking group uh, would allow one round of incorporation um, in 240? Um, maybe uh, uh, there is sufficient justification to make that plausible in the priority document. But as soon as you ask for any more um, than that, let alone the stringent requirements that the judge found was part of the invention in the patent, then uh, that is flatly incompatible with the judge's summary of the common general knowledge and the contrast that the judge himself had drawn between this common general knowledge Metzger demonstration of incorporation and the third cycle of labelled nucleotide in the patent. And it's these multiple rounds of uh, incorporation of labelled nucleotide, which the judge has emphasised on a number of occasions earlier in, in the judgment. This disclosure of multiple rounds of labelled nucleotide is only demonstrated in the patent for the first time. And it must follow that the invention is only made plausible for the first time with the data in the patent and that demonstration. So, my lords, for all these reasons, we say um, that based on the judge's own findings of the technical contribution um, and his findings on the common general knowledge, um, it, it is uh, plainly not plausible for MP2 properly construed uh, to uh, reach uh, the conclusion that, that um, all, all of the characteristics of uh, paragraphs 4 and 5 are met by the group disclosed in T2, and for all those reasons, uh, the appeal on priority uh, ought to be allowed. My Lord, unless I can assist you any further, uh, those are our submissions. Uh, no, thank you very much. So, how long would you like us to rise for while you switch teams? Um, as far as I'm aware, I think everyone is poised outside the door. I, I don't know whether Mr. Ackland has to come all the way from Gray's Inn. Uh, uh, I don't know, I will inquire. Uh, could I just say one brief thing? My learned friend raised uh, in, in his reply speech the question of what he said to the judge in the course of submissions on the uh, question of the priority level of the squeeze or the question of priority at all. Um, uh, we don't accept that uh, he made anything like the board submission that he suggested. Uh, your Lordship has got specific and limited to particular arguments which were said to be run on the road. There was no uh, suggestion that the judge should, as your lordship said, look at priority documents first. Uh, and there was no contention uh, about technical advance uh, over Metzger, etc. Uh, or anything of that kind um, so far as priority was concerned. Uh, we submit a lot of the points my learned friend that we make in particular morning, uh, simply outside the scope of any argument that was put on priority at trial, and we simply didn't have the opportunity to address it. Uh, Lords, we'll, we'll make inquiries uh, so far as um, Mr. Ackland is concerned. Oh, he's here at the back of the court. <laughs> right, <laughs> so if we give you five minutes, will that suffice? Thank you. My Lord, um, I hesitate to interrupt. I'd better send you the paragraphs I referred to in my written closing. If, I, if your lordship, um, all right, I will send means. you those paragraphs just to meet the learning friend's point. All right, thank you.
to come in? I think there's someone at the door. Do they need to come in? Or? No. Okay. You're definitely ready, yeah? And everyone's got their phone off. side in the blue box is a cleavable linker uh, and the judge found that that was from another piece of prior art called Milton that it was obvious to make that uh, linker to attach it to a nucleotide um, with a view to conjugating it to a suitable dye. Now in this image we haven't shown the, the nucleotide but the nucleotide will attach to the right hand end uh, of, the, of the molecule in the blue box. Now, um, the issue on the appeal is whether those two uh, moieties in the green box and the blue box um, joined together are an uninventive collocation uh, and therefore the, whether the claim uh, lacks inventive step uh, in the light of, of the collocation principle as explained by the House of Lords in Sabbath. Now, what I propose to do is to address you uh, on the following topics. Um, first, a bit of technical background and common general knowledge in an attempt. Yes, I, I appreciate it's difficult <coughs> councils just warming up for the court to start leaping in with picky points on language. However, I do think language is important when dealing with this issue because you use the expression um, and it's an easy slip of the tongue, I'm sure, but what you said was an uninventive collocation. Now, that is a tautology in this context. If it's a co collocation, then it follows that it's uninventive. Indeed, but my lord, my lord, the question is whether it's a collocation at well, all. Whether it's a collocation, yes, my lord. My lord, my lord is right. That was a slip of the tongue. Yeah. Um, and obviously, we'll come on to see what the test, the law applies for a collocation when we look at the uh, the authority. Uh, so, um, so my lord, by way of roadmap. A uh, little bit of technical background to make sure uh, that what follows makes sense. Um, then I'd like to look at the judge's findings briefly in relation to Milton and Onus, the prior art. Then look at the 415 patent itself. Then the law on collocation. Uh, and finally come to look at the judgments uh, uh, and explain where we say the judge went, went wrong. 
uh, and what he should have done. Um, so starting first with, uh, with, with the technical background, could my lords go to the, the judgment, which is in tab 6, or wherever my lords have it, and start at paragraph 351, which is on page 157. Just to give you your bearings, because you, you may not have read this, this, this section. This is in the section of the judgment dealing with the third pattern that isn't the subject of the appeal, but it's just where the judge explains uh, fluorescence. Um, and, and fluorescence is uh, the name given to uh, light emitted by some chem chemical molecules after they've been excited by an incoming uh, photon. And as the judge explains, um, the incoming, in the fourth line, the incoming photon of light is absorbed by the fluorophore molecule. The energy causes the excitation of an electron from its ground state, which is then in a higher energy level. The excited electron may drop back to a somewhat lower level by a process called internal conversion. That doesn't involve the release of a photon. The electron then may drop back to the original ground state, releasing a new photon. The release of this new photon is a flash of light called fluorescence. The energy of the new photon is lower than that of the, uh, uh, and different from the energy of the original incident of the photon, and the difference in wavelength is called the Stokes uh, shift. Now, uh, as we, we saw the term fluorophore used uh, in that paragraph there. That's a name that's given to refer to a molecule uh, that is capable of undergoing uh, fluorescence. It's also uh, on occasions used to refer to the part of a molecule that produces um, fluorescence. So if we could turn on now to paragraph 425, which is in the section on the 415 pattern. And there, the judge refers uh, in 425 to uh, different classes of fluorescent dyes, including xanthines, cyanines, and, and coumarins. Uh, and he gives an example of a xanthine, the xanthine group, which is a three-ring structure. Now, in, in the molecule of fluorescin, which he uses uh, in the below the paragraph, the xanthine ring is a top three ring uh, uh, of the molecule. And it's those, it's that group of three um, rings gives the molecule its fluorescence property. Uh, and that's due to the fact that that's... Sorry. Turned on. Sorry. The, the, um, the fluorescence properties comes from that alternating structure of single and chemical bonds that you see in the, uh, in the top uh, group of rings. And that's referred to as a, as, as a, a delocalized system. Now, um, over the page, in 428, uh, the judge introduces uh, rhodamines, which are a subclass of xanthine, in which there's an amino group on the xanthine core. Uh, and you can see in the, the uh, structure below the amino groups tacked onto the, the left and right end of the, of the xanthine core. Uh, and as we'll see, the dye that was obvious to make, the judge found was obvious to make from the Arnous prior art, uh, was, uh, was a rhodamine. Now, the usefulness of uh, fluorescent molecules in uh, biochemistry uh, is that they're able to be used as labels. Uh, and so what one does is one attaches them uh, to a molecule of interest, uh, and you can then visualize that molecule, and you can see what happens to it. And as I think my lords may have had over the last uh, day or so, may have picked up, if one was to use four different dyes, each attached to one of the diff four different nucleobases, A, C, G, and T, uh, you can see which of those has been incorporated into a growing strand of DNA by illuminating the sample, seeing the color that comes back, and then one can know from the color which one it, which one it is. Uh, and thereby, uh, you can have the DNA can be, be sequenced. Now, um, the dyes uh, need to be attached to the uh, the nucleotides, uh, and that's done by forming a, a chemical bond between them. Uh, and uh, as the judge explains in paragraph 431, uh, a well-known tool for doing that was to use something called uh, a linker, which is a short molecule uh, that its name suggests connects uh, the dye and the, the biomolecule in question. Well, it, I think the word you used earlier, moiety, is more accurate, because it's part of the molecule. 
Yes. So, but but if one's considering the, the, the task of joining a dye to a biological molecule, a linker was a known tool to add in for the reason that the judge explained in the first sentence, in order to prevent interaction between the dye and the biological molecule. You space them apart by the linker. Yes, but the point is, and it's important in this case, we need to distinguish between the molecule as a whole and the constituent parts of the molecule or the moieties on the other hand. Conceptually, you can analyse the parts of the molecule into different moieties, but nevertheless, they're all joined together in one molecule. They are ultimately all, all, all joined together. And... Uh, and uh, as the judge explains, and as we'll come on to see, that, that, um, the linkers are used to space them apart. Uh, and there are two classes of linkers for this purpose, uh, one of which is permanent linkers, and the other ones are cleavable linkers. And in this case, we're concerned um, with a cleavable linker. The linker that comes from the Milton prior art is one that can be added to tether the dye to the nucleotide, but then under particular reaction conditions can be reacted so as to break in half and to release the dye so that then the, uh, the nucleotide is no longer labelled. So if we go on to, uh, over the page, um, to paragraph 433, um, the judge explains um, that if you're selecting fluorophores, you need to uh, be able to select ones with properties um, suitable to allow for unambiguous detection, so they have to fluoresce at different wavelengths so that you can tell which is which. And then in 434, the judge says, an important issue is the effect in which the exercise of connecting a fluorophore to a biomolecule could have on the photochemical properties of fluorophores. And then he lists uh, a number of those properties. And, and if I can just explain what those are so my laws have them. Um, the first one is the absorbance and emission wavelengths. So that's the wavelength of light at which the, first of all, the absorbance of light, the molecule absorbs light. Uh, and the second one, the emission maximum is the uh, emission wavelength, is the wavelength at which it fluoresces. Quantum yield it is the ratio of the em number of emitted photons to the number of absorbed photons. So there is a number between naught and one, uh, and the higher the number, um, the, the greater percentage of the absorbed photons that are uh, emitted. The extinction coefficient is a number that quantifies how readily the fluorophore absorbs light. So with a higher extinction coefficient, uh, the mo a molecule will absorb more and therefore emit more. And the brightness uh, is the mathematical product of the extinction coefficient and the quantum yield. So ultimately, how much, how many photons are emitted by uh, a fluorophore is a, is a product of how strongly it absorbs, and then the ratio of the, of the uh, emitted photons to the absorbed photons. Photostability is how stable the fluorophore is to uh, uh, to light. Uh, the patterns that we are not concerned with on the appeal was all about photostability, uh, and it was common ground in, in that case that all fluorophores at some stage will degrade. Question is, is, is how quickly that happens. And the final one is the tendency to quench. Quenching is the process where uh, fluorescence intensity of a fluorophore uh, is decreased due to interactions between the fluorophore uh, and its environment. Essentially, it's when the fluorophore <coughs> loses its, its absorbed energy by non radiative processes rather than by emitting uh, a photon uh, of light. So, for example, the energy is transmit, transferred to a different molecule by collision rather than by release of a, of a photon. So, so those are the various properties of uh, fluorophores that the, uh, the school person would be uh, aware of. And the judge goes on to explain in the rest of 434 uh, and uh, in 435 um, that the skilled person would first of all know that the spectral properties of xanthine dyes can be altered by changes uh, on the xanthine core, and that's because they affect the delocalized system of that core. So just thinking back to uh, the xanthines, or one can see one in the small, small diagram at the top of this page, 
if the linker extends that delocalized system, it changes the whole nature of the delocalized system and effectively makes a new die. Uh, and it was common ground that the skilled person would understand that if that occurred, there would be a change uh, to the properties of the die. But just pausing here for a moment, it's obviously it's not the case in relation to the, the ultimate molecule that we're concerned about. It's common ground that that doesn't change the delocalized system of the, the dye itself. Then going back to 434, the skilled person also knew that changes made further away from the xanthine core were less likely to make any change to special properties, um, whilst changes closer to the core were more likely to have an effect. Now those are changes that don't affect uh, the delocalized system, uh, and, and the closer they are, the more likely to have an effect. Uh, and then the judge in 435 finds that ultimately that it's an empirical field, and whilst after the event one can look at a molecule with a linker attached and rationalize any change in, um, in properties that ha has been seen, uh, in advance it's not possible to make precise predictions as to what will, uh, will occur. Now, um, perhaps we can just go back to uh, tab two and the diagram in our skeleton. So that's page 33 uh, of the bundle. So the, cl the relevant claim is claim one of the four and five patterns, which is to a nucleotide labeled with that molecule. And as I hope my lords have, uh, MGI's case at trial and, and on appeal uh, is that that molecule uh, is a collocation uh, of the two parts, the dye in the green box uh, and the linker uh, in, the, uh, in the blue box. Well, I don't think it makes any <laughs> difference to your case, but it, it, the claimed product has to be a collocation of three parts because you've also got the nucleotide. Um, and um, I mean, I don't, as I say, I don't think it makes any difference because uh, just as you distinguish between the two moieties which you've just focused on, the nucleotide is another moiety. It's another moiety. And, and as we'll, we'll see, the judge's finding in relation to Milton was that it would be obvious to attach the linker to a nucleotide with a view to attaching it to a, uh, a suitable dye. So the judge has put in, if you, if you might say, one, one obvious bucket, the nucleotide and linker combination. Okay. And then he then moves on to, to consider it. And, and, and as I just anticipated, the judge found that each half of the, the collocation shown uh, uh, in that diagram was um, obvious. Uh, and MGI's case is that um, there's no synergistic or non-obvious interaction between those two parts of the molecule. When they're connected, the dye still fluoresces, and the linker still links uh, the dye to the nucleotide and still cleaves under the same conditions. And both parts of the molecule do exactly the same thing when linked together uh, as they would have done before. Uh, and so for that reason, uh, MGI's case is that this is a, a collocation how does that work with a linking moiety? You can understand how a dye, you can say it works the same as before, because it will fluoresce when it's on its own as when it's incorporated into a larger molecule. But a linking section is inherently linking. It doesn't stand on its own. I mean, of course you can make it on its own, but its function is as a linker. Yes, but, but if one thinks of the, the obvious molecule from Milton, which is the nucleotide and the linker, what that does is that enables something to be attached to the end of it and then to cleave in the specific conditions when, uh, when you want to cleave it. Uh, that's the property of the linker, and that property isn't changed by attaching the dye to the end of it. Um, so, my lord, let's, can we just look at the judge's findings briefly then in relation to um, the trial? So, back to tab six, 
and to paragraph 470. This is where the judge starts to deal with the, um, with, uh, the, the prior art. And um, he, he, in 471, he says at the end, the essential idea disclosed is to conjugate a suitable fluorophore via a suitable cleavable linker to a suitably functionalized nucleoside. Uh, and he says a suitably functionalized nucleoside is shown in, uh, on page uh, 38. I think we probably ought to get Milton out briefly just to look at a couple of passages in this. Um, just for context. So that's in the supplemental bundle at tab uh, 8. <coughs> and, and if my laws could also keep an eye on the, the judgment of same time, we can just see how, what the judge is, uh, what is saying here. So it, in para 472 of the judgment, the judge refers to paragraph page 18 of Milton, which is 183 of the, the bundle. Uh, and so if we look at page 18 of, of Milton, <laughs> paragraph that starts at line 12, the methods of the present invention make use of conventional detection labels. Uh, detection can be carried out by any suitable method, including fluorescence spectroscopy or by any other optical means. The preferred label is a fluorophore. It goes on to define what a fluorophore is. And then many suitable fluorescent labels are known. And it gives uh, some examples. And down at line 29, other commercially available fluorescent labels include, but are not limited to, fluorescin, rhodamine, including TMR, Texas Red, and ROX, Alexa, Bodopi, Acridine, Coumarin. So, uh, and obviously one of those is, is the rhodamines, of which ultimately the, the dye um, the judge found to be obvious from Arnus is, is a member of that class. If we then turn over to page 21 in Milton, uh, and the, the middle paragraph starting at line uh, 11, uh, as well as the moiety cleavable by water soluble phosphines or transition metal based catalyst, the cleavable linkage may also comprise a spacer unit. The spacer distances the nucleotide base from the cleavage site or label. The length of the moiety is unimportant, provided that the label is held a sufficient distance from the nucleotide so as not to interfere with the interaction between the nucleotide and the enzyme. So the point being made there um, by Milton is the precise length doesn't matter, but you've got to be far enough away so the dye doesn't interfere with the DNA polymerase. And then if we go on um, then to page 47 of Milton, we end, this is where Milton describes the synthesis of um, the linker, which is the uh, we'll see in due course the one that's referred to as link 3 by, by the passage of suits. And that's the molecule in the bottom right-hand corner on page 47 at the top, 212 of the bundle. And over onto page 49 at the top, Milton attaches that linker to a dye, and that's a dye that's a commercially available dye called Psi and then the dye is the part on the left dye is the part on the left so everything from my lord looks at the, 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 the big molecule below um, you can see there's, there's an amide bond uh, yeah. the, the dye is the part on the left and everything from the NH to the right is the, uh, the cleavable linker yep. and then if, if one goes over the page to page 50 we see that that dye uh, and linker has then been added to uh, a nucleotide, and this is a this is a modified uh, DUTP, which has been added onto the the right hand end. Uh, the only difference in this diagram is that the dye has just been drawn as psi three rather than the whole the whole structure. Sorry, can you remind me what's DUTP? 
Uh, it's the um, UTP is uracil triphosphate, which is the version of thymidine that's present in RNA. RNA yeah. Now, um, if one goes, then goes back to the to the, uh, to the judgment. Um, Power 477, you can see that um, the judge has set out those structures, uh, and he explains that the thymidine form of the same label nucleotide is used in two cycles of sequencing by synthesis, uh, from page 52 of Milton. The results are shown in the form of gels using radio-labeled uh, phosphorus. No results are presented based on using fluorescent detection. The gels show that the linker did not prevent incorporation of the nucleotide, although there's evidence in the gels incorporation was not 100%. Uh, incorporation of the second cycle is, is reasonably clear. The skilled person would see these results as supportive of the teaching of Milton that the linker should not interfere with the polymerase reaction. And then over the page, his, his ultimate finding on uh, Milton. In terms of claim 1 of 4 and 5, Milton discloses the nucleotide labelled with a molecule identical to the claim up to the middle amide of claim 1. In other words, it discloses what I will call derivatized nucleotide plus linker LN3. And when we look at the pattern, my lord, that terminology will, will make more sense. It will be obvious for the skilled person, given Milton, to make that linker nucleotide combination with a view to conjugating that combined molecule to suitable dye, which may have to be derivatized. They would make this molecule with a reasonable prospect that if they tested it in sequencing by synthesis, it would not interfere with incorporation, with the incorporation reaction catalyzed by DNA polymerase. So that was the judge's findings in relation to, to, to Milton. But we nevertheless need to take into account what he says in 479, in no case that it would be obvious for the skilled person to alight on dye 16 of Arnost at all. A reference to rhodamines does not take the skilled person to Arnost on any view. So leaving aside the collocation case, it's not obvious to combine the two. So th that's the, the Milton side of the equation. The, the, the honest side of the equation, we can probably do um, just from the, from the judgment. Uh, honest was a, uh, a patent that uh, disclosed various new uh, dyes, some of which were, were rhodamine uh, dyes. We see that at the end of paragraph 480 of uh, the judgment. And if we go um, over the page to paragraph 486, you see uh, a molecule set out there which Arnest refers to as uh, molecule 16 and that's that, as we'll see in due course that is what the patent in suit calls dye 2 um, as the judge notes in paragraph 489 in the, the first uh, sentence now there was an issue at the trial about whether it would have been obvious to uh, functionalize di 16 with a short um, uh, four carbon uh, arm and the judge decided that uh, in power 493 uh, and he held that it was and he held that I, I find given honest an obvious molecule for the skilled person to make in the context of labeling biologically active molecules in a bioassay with the left hand end of the formula of claim one of the 415 pattern up to the middle amide. This is the four carbon option. I will call this molecule the four carbon linker uh, of di 16. So that, that was the judge's finding in relation to uh, Arnest. So then when we turn over the page to paragraph 501, uh, the judge says, on the conclusions I've reached, it follows that claim one will be invalid if it's a collocation uh, and it's a sets out that it's a combination of the two aspects that he's um, uh, just been dealing with. So well, at that stage, what I'd like to do now is have a look at the 415 patent it, itself, so we can see what the patent says about um, its molecule and its properties. So that's the core bundle, uh, sorry, the supplemental bundle in tab two.
although in the form before your lordships, um, the 415 patents claims are quite narrow, uh, the disclosure is much wider. Uh, and as we see in paragraph one, uh, the 415 patent says, the present invention provides novel rhodamine dye compounds, labeled conjugates, uh, and methods for, for their use. So uh, at least in its original form, the patent saw its part of its invention as being the dyes themselves. And if we look down at, right at the bottom of page uh, two of the patent, paragraph seven, and then over the page to, to page three, there's a, a general formula that we can pass over. Um, and in the middle, in paragraph that eight. That undoubtedly is a Marcouche formula. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> One of mind boggling size, no doubt. Yes. Um, but, but we have then in paragraph eight uh, uh, a particular compound, and that is, uh, that's die 16 of uh, Arna's but with the, uh, the linker arm that the judge found to be obvious uh, attached to it. And then uh, in paragraph 9, in another embodiment, the compounds of the present invention can be conjugated with a variety of substrate moieties, such as, for example, uh, nucleosides uh, and so on. According to a second aspect of the invention, therefore, they are provided dye compounds comprising linker groups to enable, for example, covalent attachment to such substrate moieties. And then we turn over the page. There we see uh, the molecule that is ultimately the one that is claimed as being conjugated to the nucleoside, which has the, the, uh, the two bits that my lords are now hopefully uh, familiar with. Uh, now, importantly, the next paragraph, according to a third aspect of the invention, uh, provides a nucleoside and a nucleotide compound defined by the formula. And then we see NL dye, wherein N is a nucleotide, L is an optional linker moiety, and dye is the compound according to the present invention, uh, and wherein said compound is a fluorescent compound. Now, we say this this uh, this is referred to, I think, by the judge as the building block notation, uh, and we say this is important because this shows that the patentee sees the combinations of the nucleotides, the dyes, and the linkers as being one that where the, the properties of those moieties are maintained, notwithstanding that they are coupled together. Uh, and it's not the case that the properties of the dye and the linker get subsumed uh, into a, a whole new molecule, such that those, those properties are no longer sensibly present. So I mean, if one was to think of a, a contrasting example, something like sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is a... I'm sorry, <laughs> but drawing analogies with ionic salts is not a good idea. Well, let, let's, try, let's try an organic one, if you will. Propane and isopropanol. So propane is a three-carbon chain. It's a hydrocarbon gas that burns. If one removes one of the middle hydrogens and replaces it with a hydroxyl, you have isopropanol, which is a solvent very different properties. It wouldn't be sensible to say that uh, propane, uh, sorry, isopropanol uh, retains the properties of propane and water within it. It is a whole new molecule with its own independent properties. Uh, and that, that will likely be the case for the vast majority of organic molecules. But there are some cases where that isn't the case. And we say this, this is one of those cases. And that's how the patent is, is putting it forward. It sees the overall molecule as, a, as the dye attached via a linker to the nucleotide. Uh, and that each of those maintains its identity and its properties uh, when uh, they are so joined. <coughs> now, um, in, in the usual way, the then patent then comes on to give more detailed descriptions of the invention, and we see the Marcouche formula again, which we can pass over. Uh, and then on the next page, page five, there's a die, die one, which again we can pass over, but on page six, we come back to the die two, which is the one that we are concerned about, and that is compound 16 from, from, from Arnoust. Uh, and again, we see in paragraph 30 uh, the, the obvious derivation of that molecule, and then Combined one. 
Now, um, if we go on to page, paragraph 44 uh, on page, bottom of page 8, uh, and then o over on to page 9, we see another uh, building block type notation where um, nucleosides or nucleotide labeled with dyes in the invention may have the formula, and we then have a ribose uh, ring where we have a B, which is the nuclear base, which is the myelors. No, it's the part of the DNA or RNA that changes and give each of one their different characteristics. Uh, then an L for a linker and a D for an, and a dye. So again, it's the same same point, um, but they're being seen as, as separate blocks um, put together. Um, if my lords then can turn on to uh, paragraph 75. This is where the pattern uh, is talking about kits uh, of modified nucleotides labelled with dyes. Uh, so the, the invention also provides kits of uh, modified nucleotides labelled with dyes. Such kits will generally include at least one modified nucleotide or nucleoside labelled with a dye according to the invention, together with at least another uh, further component. In 76, where the kits comprise a plurality, particularly two, or more particularly four modified nucleotides labelled with a dye, the different nucleotides may be labelled with a different dye compound. Where the different nucleosides are labelled with a different dye compound is the feature of the kits. The dyes are spectrally distinguishable fluorescent dyes. So that's the obvious point that you need to tell them apart. And then if we skip out that definition down to line 39, when two modified nucleotides labelled with fluorescent dyes are supplied in kit form, feature of the invention that the spectrally distinguishable fluorescent dyes can be excited at the same wavelength, such as, for example, by the same laser. So the idea is, is you have two that you shine the same light on, they'll both absorb enough to, um, uh, to emit. And then when four modified nucleotides labelled with fluorescent dyes are supplied in the kit form, it's a feature that two of them can be excited at one wavelength and the other two at another. So you only need two lasers to be able to uh, image all four dyes. In 77, um, in one embodiment, the kit is, is a modified label, modified nucleotide label with dye 2. So that's, that's our uh, dye of interest. Mm -hmm. And a second with a second dye, uh, and it gives some requirements about the absorption. And, and three lines from the bottom of 77. More particularly, the modified nucleotides are labeled with dye 2, and an alternate dye that excites at 532 nanometers, such as ATO 532 or Alexa 532. So those are commercially available uh, dyes. In 78, it talks about the other, the other dyes that are excitable at a different wavelength. Um, <coughs> and over the page gives some examples of, of those. And, and if we look on page 14, starting at line 2, it's a, in a particular embodiment of the invention, provides a set of nucleotides, A, C, G, and T, each labelled with one of the following spectrally distinguishable dyes, dye 2, ATO535, Psi5 analogue, such as uh, the Feriana dye, uh, and dye 681. Uh, and then it gives another um, different combination. And then in 79 and 80, it refers to alternatives, first of dye 681, and then secondly uh, of um, this, the S. 07181 dye. Now, my lords, what we say um, about this uh, is that the, the patent is putting forward a whole range of different dyes that can be used um, with uh, the linker to attach to uh, nucleotides. And the criteria of choice of the dyes in the patent is not whether there's any interaction between the dye and the linker was one of two things. Firstly, can it be excited with the same laser as at least one other dye? And secondly, does it have an emission spectrum that allows it to be distinguishable from all the other dyes uh, in the kit? And what the pattern doesn't, uh, isn't concerned about is addressing interactions um, between the dye and uh, the linker, save in relation to one specific example that I'm going to come on to in a moment. Then follows some uh, examples that we can 
pass through relatively quickly. Um, the first one, starting at, on page 14, is the synthesis of Di2, which you can see on, culminating on page 16, um, with Di2 uh, at the top. And in paragraph 91, we can note that the only spectrochemical property of that dye that's given in line 19 is that its maximum absorption was at 560 nanometers. The bottom of page 16, they then attach the carboxy functional linker arm, and over the page, on page 17, we see formula 2, which is about line 15, the second one, that's the carboxy functional linker arm, and again, just to keep our bearings, that's the molecule the judge found was obvious from uh, Arnous. Uh, and in 95, at line 28 or so, it says that the uh, absorption maximum of that was slightly different to the undurotized one at 570 nanometers. Now, um, we then, there's then a couple of other dyes that are synthesized that we don't need to be concerned with. But my Lord's turn over to page 20 of the pattern. We see here example four, synthesis of the azide linker, which they call LN3. Uh, and again, models can take, take it from me, it's common ground, that the synthesis set out there is exactly the same one that's in uh, Milton and ends up on page 22, having made linker three uh, down in the bottom right hand corner. Then over onto page 23, example five, uh, we have attachment of azide linker, preparation di2 dash linker 3. And obviously, my lord appreciate we rely upon this as more the building block notation, showing that the pattern sees these as the die attached to the linker. And the synthesis is described. Now, importantly, there's no information given as to the fluorescent properties of the die now that it has the linker attached. There's, there's no information at all. Uh, and, and it's obviously this is the step the judge, when he came to consider the collocation issue, was concerned about. It would be adding the linker to the uh, die too. And so the patterns doesn't give any information as to whether there's any uh, effect of adding the linker, whether it makes it the die better, worse, or whether it does nothing at all. Uh, and then on page 24, step two is the attachments we see at line 15, attachment of di2, linker 3, to T nucleotide triphosphate. So again, more, more building block notation. Uh, it attaches the, uh, the linker, and again, so it attaches the nucleoside to the entire molecule. Uh, and again, there's no information given about the photochemical properties of the dye having had the nucleus. Then we can very quickly go through the, the, the other examples. Uh, and all I want to point out from these, from example six onwards, is, is the repeated use of the, um, the building block notation. So we see on page 25, example six, Feriana, linker, linker three. <coughs> Similar, page 27, top of the page, Feriana, linker three, ATP. 29, same point. <coughs> under example 8 uh, and page 30 now um, just before the German my lord uh, page 31 example 9 I mentioned a moment ago there was one difference in when the, uh, the patterns is concerned about interactions uh, and uh, you see here example 9 preparation of assay 532 PEG-12 linker 3, BGTP. Now, uh, what, what they've done here, what the patentee's done, is he's added a polyethylene glycol spacer into the linker. And the reason why they've done that is explained back in <coughs> paragraph 37. 
and perhaps I can ask your lordship to turn back to 37 and read it. And I'll have a glass of water. Stop. Thank you. Using the polyethylene glycol spacer group is because it was known, it was common ground, it was common general knowledge, that the guanine nucleotide was capable of quenching the dye. So the polyethylene glycol was put in for that purpose. And this is the only <coughs> place in the pattern where it, it, it considers the issue of any interaction between uh, the dye and uh, <coughs> any other part of the linker. And the final uh, bit of the patterns, uh, just to draw your lordship's attention to, is the uh, last paragraph uh, on page 37. <coughs> 203, where 20 cycles of sequencing were performed using the labelled nucleotides have just been described, uh, and the error rates of less than 1% the first 20 cycles were encountered, <coughs> meaning the known sequence of the, mono the mono template was correctly identified. Now, we say that's of limited useful information to a school person. All it tells you is that the bases, 20 bases, were able to be sequenced. It doesn't allow any conclusions to be drawn about the properties fluorescent properties of the various conjugates used, other than they were such to allow sequencing uh, to occur. Since, since sequencing is the object of the exercise, what's the problem with that? <coughs> well, well it, it doesn't tell you whether there was any interaction adverse <coughs> or otherwise between the linker and the dye. It's simply that the the, the properties, the, the there were the dye remained able to fluoresce enough to allow sequencing to, to occur. It doesn't allow you to infer that there's no adverse interaction at all between the linker and the dye. Well, can I just make four points in relation to the pattern just to draw this together? The first one is, is that the patterns approaches the conjugation of the dye, the linker to the nucleoside uh, on the basis that they're the separate moiety uh, and that using that building block notation that we've seen throughout the pattern, it takes the approach that when the dye is conjugated to linker 3, <coughs> it's not seen as a new molecule with its own separate properties, but it remains the dye connected to linker 3. Secondly, there's no suggestion in the pattern that there's any Synergy when dye 2 was added to linker 3 and all the nu nucleotides. In fact, the pattern provides no information at all as to whether there's any change. <coughs> In contrast, where there is an effect, the polyethylene glycol linker, the pattern comes down. Uh, <coughs> and the fourth point is the one I've just made that the fact that the dye 2 linker 3 combination can be used in sequence doesn't tell you anything about the properties of that molecule after conjugation, other than the fact that it can be used in sequencing. <coughs> but as we'll see when we come to the authorities, the fact that the, the, the entity alleged to be a collocation is itself useful isn't an answer to the issue about whether uh, it's an event. <coughs> Resume at uh, two o'clock. Um, 
not pushing any pressure on you at all, but um, how are you doing time-wise? I'm about halfway through my name. Okay, very good. 